Nowhere in the scripture does it teach that you had to search and pursue happiness. You find happiness as you do your duty. You find happiness as you lead a disciplined life before God. Nothing else can fill it. Marriage can't fill it. Drugs can't fill it. Sex can't fill it. Alcohol can't fill it. But the person of Jesus Christ can fill it. Good morning. It's great to be here today. My wife and I have been out of town for about 10 days. We visited our daughter in Nevada, Nevada, however you want to say it. Uh, tomato, tomato. And she had just had a little girl, her first girl, had two little boys, which I can't even, my mind doesn't quite compute that it was our 13th grandchild. And so we're um, totally outnumbered in so many ways. <laughs> They're all going to be over for Thanksgiving. So we're going to take an offering for a turkey and some. <laughs> oh, we should, maybe for sitters. Um, let me ask you to stand. We're going to read our passage today, which is the last verses there in Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Then we'll pray and we'll step into our verse-by-verse -verse study as we finish out this chapter this morning. Paul says, let your conduct, your conversation, your lifestyle be worthy of of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or if I'm absent, I, I can hear that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, in other words, that you're unified, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted, it's been given as a gift on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, that's a gift, the gift of salvation, the gift of faith, but the other gift, he says, is also to suffer for His sake, which we don't really want that gift too much, but he says it's part of the deal. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now you hear in me that Paul is going through difficulty, suffering. He's in prison. So, Lord, as we open this passage together, as we ask you by your Spirit to dig around in our hearts and speak to us, may we be receptive. May our hearts not be hard or clouded by the cares of the world so much that we can't hear your voice that your voice would be familiar to us, that it wouldn't be distant, that it wouldn't be unrecognizable to us, but that more and more and more we would recognize the voice of the one who says, my sheep, hear my voice, they know it. So speak to us today, Lord, and may you open our ears to hear all that you'd have to say. We pray and ask and believe in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Grab a seat if you would. The theme of the book of Philippians, Jesus' key to joy. So if I were to ask, if I were to ask you this question, what makes a healthy church? What makes a joyous church? What makes a spiritual church? It wouldn't be necessarily the size or the numbers that would define a spiritual church or a joyous church might not be the natural giftedness that people have. Some can sing, play guitars, some can, you know, do all kinds of interesting things with their hearts and hands. Maybe not even the spiritual giftedness. The Corinthian church was full of all kinds of spiritual gifts, but they just weren't very loving to one another. But what, what makes for a healthy or joyful or spiritual church? Certainly not a superstar pastor or 
the size of the building or the beauty of it or caliber of teaching, the, the youth ministry or children's ministry, whatever. I mean, all those are good things. They're great things. But I think in our passage today, Paul outlines or gives some characteristics or some answers to this question of what does a healthy church, a joyful church really look like? And he has some words that kind of jump out in these verses. Words like, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. He says, stand fast. Strive together. Don't be terrified by the enemy, your adversary. Recognize that suffering could come your way. In fact, he says, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here in me. A healthy church, listen, a good church, a joyful church is one that's standing firm, one that is living what they believe, and Paul phrases it this way, conduct worthy of the gospel. United together in, in spirit and faith, all for the sake of the gospel. The gospel. The fact that, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. That, that's what Jesus said. That's part of the gospel. See, standing firm in that and having a... a, a a sense of unity around that, that Jesus is who Jesus claimed to be. He's the Savior. He's not just a great teacher, although he was a great teacher. Not just another philosophy for life. It's okay if you believe that, but that's good for you, not for me. That's not the gospel. Not just a good example, although he was, and calls us to be. But he was a savior, a sacrificial lamb for our sins. That's the gospel, that we can't save ourselves. And that if anyone come or be in Christ, come to Christ or be in Christ, that he becomes a new creature, she becomes a new creation. Old things begin to pass away and all things become new. So here's the thing. Listen, if you believe you've come to Christ, and your life didn't change at all, you need to give it another shot. Something's wrong. You perhaps just emotionally responded to something and never really surrendered your life to Jesus. See, Paul says this as he begins to close out this. He says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, the way you live your life should reflect how worthy Christ is in your life. He speaks that to us individually, and he speaks that to us corporately as a church. A healthy church is standing firm in the gospel, in its belief, and in its conduct. The gospel, the truth of a Savior that we all need, and the truth of the Scripture that we must all heed. The truth of the gospel that we need a Savior and the truth of the Scripture that we need to heed because all Scripture speaks of Him. Jesus said that. He said, you search the Scriptures, but they speak of me. And He is the epitome of the gospel. The Scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we have these verses. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, not just the parts we want to believe, but all of it. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, that means mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Or Paul would say it like this, so that your conduct might be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's a savior, and we have the scripture that speaks of that savior, teaching us how to live the gospel, the truth about Jesus, and the instructions for living 
for Jesus. So he starts off by saying, our position is this, to let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, that word, your, your conduct, your conversation, it says in the Revised Standard, your manner of life, it, it's an interesting Greek word. It's the Greek word politeuma. It's where we get our word, believe it or not, Politics. That's scary, isn't it? But what is being said here is let your conduct be as a citizen of heaven. That that's your political stance, so to speak. It, it, it said you're in a, co a community or a colony under a godly, heavenly government. That's your political stance. So live like you're in that group, like you're a part of that kingdom, a citizen of heaven. See, after a great battle, a thousand miles away from Rome, in a place called Philippi, those who lived there in that place, in that community, assisted the Romans in that battle. And after the bloody battle ceased, the emperor decided, well, based on those who served, based on those who were a part of our battle. He decreed that all those in Philippi would now become citizens of Rome, which was a huge thing. With all its benefits, with, with, with all its privileges, they now became officially Roman citizens. And that was a big, big deal in that day because Rome controlled the world. And as a citizen of Rome, you had all kinds of rights and privileges that others did not possess. And so what Paul is saying, after a bloody battle on the cross, when Jesus Christ shed his blood and his body was broken and then rose victorious from the grave, now we can choose to become citizens of heaven and are called to live as heavenly citizens with all the rights and with all the privileges of what it means to have a Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's amazing. And so this is what he's saying. Now that you've stepped into that world, now that you've received Christ as your Savior, now live like that. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the book of Philippians later, you'll hear Paul say it this way. Listen, in chapter 3, he says, brethren, this is Paul speaking to those in Philippi, and believe it or not, speaking to you and I right now by the Holy Spirit, brethren, sister, and if you will, and join in following my example, Paul says, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern, he says, for many walk of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping, it breaks his heart, that there are some who are enemies of the cross. Of Christ. Their end, well, it's, just, it's destruction. And here's why. Their God is the God of the belly. In other words, their, 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 their fleshly desires. Whose glory is, is their shame. The, 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 they take great glory in the evil things they do. Their mind is just set on earthly things. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform not only from the inside, but our body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Paul says, see, there's a pattern, there's a way to live as a citizen of heaven. Stand fast in the Spirit, he says, that's one way. Strive together for the gospel. And the understanding of this is to work together as a team, as an army, kind of in this battle together for the truth of the gospel, for the truth of Scripture. A, listen, a good church, a healthy church, a joyous church lives what they believe. They have a lifestyle, if you will, a conduct that's worthy of the gospel. 
true citizens of heaven have a transformed life that looks different than those who just live for themselves. They, they work together for the sake and the faith of the gospel. And, and the gospel is more than salvation. The gospel is more than, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's part of it, but it's much more than just the initial salvation experience. It's about applying that truth. It's about living that life. It's having a transformed heart that begins to live a life as a citizen of heaven, a life of truth, a life based on truth, a life that wants to stand fast, stand firm for the gospel of truth. See, please dial in, please tune in. We live in a culture, you and I, where truth is no longer absolute. We live in a culture that's based on political correctness. And because of this political correct culture that we all live in, we're very intimidated about things that we are to talk about. Well, you can't talk about that. You can't talk about absolute truth. You can't talk about absolute wrong. There's people who say that they're woke to social issues. And so... It's all mixed together of things you can and can't talk about that have to do with race and gender and sexual preferences and religion and where does life begin. And so we're living in a culture right now that says, whoa, 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 what's true for you may not be true for me. There's no such thing as absolute truth. It's a progressive thing. So you're not supposed to, if you're political correct or woke, to have any absolutes. But that's not the gospel. That's not the truth of the Scripture. See, the, the Scripture, the gospel, from the beginning to the end, has all kinds of absolute truths. There are things in Scripture that are absolutely right, and there's things in Scripture that are absolutely wrong. But we live in a culture that has began to say, well, that, that, that's not true. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is totally different from Islam. I can't say Islam is right and Christianity is right. How could that be? Where they're, where they're opposed to one another in their belief system. It's not the same as Mormonism. It's not the same as Jehovah Witness. It's not even the same as Catholicism. It's very different. But whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's not politically correct to say that, John. I know that's the problem. But we're called, Paul says, let your conduct, your conversation be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what do I do? Stop being a citizen of heaven? No. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ embraces the truth of the Bible and all its absolutes. The truth about marriage. From the very beginning, God created man and woman. He instituted marriage, not you or I, not our culture. That, that's the truth of Scripture. You know, God speaks some absolute, some truth about lifestyle. God says drunkenness is wrong. That's what he says. He says that, that certain lifestyles who, who carry on a manner of speech, he, he even talks about be, be careful of the things you say. Don't be lewd. Don't be profane. The absolute truth about forgiveness, that you and I have a responsibility to forgive one another. He speaks about the love of money that our culture is so enamored with. He speaks about the truth about homosexuality, regardless of what the culture says. That's the gospel. And so he calls us to stand firm in that and not to, to find ourselves intimidated by the adversaries or the lies of the enemy that wants to say, well, none of that's really true. That was all back then. But Paul says, wait a minute. You're a citizen of heaven. Let your conversation, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're called to stand fast together in 
that lifestyle and in that truth from the very beginning. God spoke the truth. He said, you know, Adam and Eve, there, there, there's all this stuff here. You know, enjoy it. You know, have, have dominion. And, and, but there, there's this one tree I don't want you to mess with. It's off limits. Everything else is yours. Go for it. But in the moment you eat of that, you'll die. And the enemy came along and he said, uh, it won't, you won't die. No, see, see, God doesn't want you to have that because once you have it, you'll be wise like him. You'll know all the difference between good and bad. And it really won't kill you. But God said it would. And we live in a time now where the enemy says, oh, that's not bad. That won't kill you. God just doesn't want you to have fun. God's a big killjoy. You should live how you want to live. And you can still be a citizen. God's anti-fun. And he tries to convince you that that life is not found in what's true, it's found in what's not true. But the word of the gospel is still true, that there are certain decisions that you can make and choices that you buy into and lies that you believe, and it always produces death. Death inside, death to relationships, death to marriages, death to parenting, all these different influences and God, God says to us through his word, through Paul, as he speaks to those in Philippi, who, by the way, are going through a very difficult time, he says, let your life, your living, be about the truth of the gospel. Get on the right team. That's what he says. Stand fast together. Be, be a citizen of heaven, a, a godly kingdom, and don't allow yourself to be intimidated by the enemy. But, but what if they think I'm a you know, a conservative, you know, narrow-minded Christian. You are. Is that bad? Well, the culture's convinced us that it is bad to be someone who believes absolute truth given to us by God through His Word and His Holy Spirit, just as the enemy came to Adam and Eve and said, you can't believe that. And it brought death to their life. We as believers, as a church, as citizens of God's kingdom, need to stand fast, to strive together for the faith, the truth of the gospel. That's what he says. That's our calling. That's getting on the team together and saying, this is what will really bring life and joy and purpose and meaning to our lives. And it's what's right. Paul goes on to say, when he challenges us and them to stand fast for the gospel, be of one spirit, one mind. And he says, and don't be terrified by your adversaries. Don't, don't be intimidated by the lies of the enemy or the culture you live in. We're, we're given the gift of salvation. And then he goes on to say, for it's been granted on behalf of Christ, verse 29, not only to believe in him, to trust in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, we're all for the gift of salvation, right? Man, I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven. You know, God doesn't hold anything against me. My debt's been cleared. Oh, we got one more gift for you. What's that? Suffering. What? Yeah, yeah. It, it may include that in your life if you truly stand for the gospel. See, the founder of the church in Philippi is in prison, who's telling them, well, what he says is that you, you, you may have the same conflict which you saw in me and now here in me because they were going through a difficult time. See, the Romans of that day saw the followers of Jesus Christ in Philippi as, well, weird, superstitious people. Oh, they believe in this one God. They, they believe in uh, resurrection. They, they are even willing to put him before Caesar. And near, they're, 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 they're very superstitious people. In fact... The Roman officials of that day saw the Christians in Philippi as a danger to the Roman culture because they didn't bow to some of the rites and rituals of Rome. They weren't polytheistic in their belief of God. They, 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 they saw them as a threat to their culture. Sound familiar? They saw them as, whoa, we better be careful with these Christians because their viewpoints about life are so different. 
So Paul gives them this encouragement, this insight. He said, it might even bring suffering into your life to follow Jesus. Now, we all know, please, please listen, we all know not all suffering is because we follow Jesus, right? Sometimes we suffer because of our own foolishness, our own sin, our own wrong choices. See, I could decide. I'm going to drive 75, 80 miles an hour through Gulf Breeze. That would be a smart choice, wouldn't it? The little bitty town with all the cameras going off, every red light. I, I would have a lot of tickets. Or I could say, you know what? I'm going to do a backflip off the dock down there at the end of the street into the water. I can't do a backflip. It would be a backflop. It would be a bad choice for me. I, I one time was in Utah with a group of friends about four years ago, and being a surfer, I thought, I can snowboard. Hey, I'm a surfer. I'm, Lynn, you get the skis. I got the snowboard. I got the helmet. I got the snowboard. I saw stars every five minutes. My shoulder was super swollen. I took lessons for three days. I could not snowboard. Lynn would pass me laying in the snow with her skis. Finally, the guy I was there with, visiting with, he had this place we were staying there. And he said, John, you can do it. You can do it. Come on. So he took me up in this other place in Powder Mountain or something, and we're trying to do it, and I keep falling, and, and I'm like, I'm done. You know, I'm seeing stars every time my head hit the snow, my shoulder's swollen, my back's hurting. He comes over, come on, one more time, we're going up. I said, I'm just laying in the snow. I go, I'm finished, man. I'm done. He, he goes, no, no, one more time, one more time. I said, look. I feel like I've been in a fight with Mike Tyson. He bit both my ears off. <laughs> he looked at me and he, laying in the snow. <laughs> he goes, you're done. I go, yeah, I'm done. So some suffering we, we bring upon ourselves. Psalm 107.17 says this, Fools, because of their transgression, believing a lie, and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. They made their own choices. They were fools. They did that which they knew they shouldn't do. And Proverbs 22, 3 says, a prudent man foresees evil. He recognizes it and hides himself. But the simple, the foolish, pass on and they're punished. Sometimes we bring our own suffering. There's another verse. Well, I don't have that one written down. But I used to tell my kids every day, you'll make a choice. There's God's plan and there's the enemy's plan. And every day you'll choose whose plan you'll follow, and you'll receive the consequences of that. See, we we have suffering because of our own choices, but we also have suffering many times, not not because we follow Christ, but because of other people's choices. You ever had suffering or difficulty come in your life because of someone else's choice? How about a drunken driver who chooses to get in the car behind the wheel, and brings about suffering to many, many people's lives because of another person's choice. I think of the story of Joseph who had received a dream from God and how one day, you know, his brothers would bow to him and how God was going to make him a great leader. And he goes and he shares this dream, be it boastfully or be it excitedly. However the story is interpreted by you, it was a dream from God. He shared it. And his brothers, out of jealousy and envy, beat him, stripped him, and threw him into a pit, and he was sold as a slave. It wasn't Joseph's actions that caused it, but the actions of someone else. David, that that great king who slew the giant and sort of rocketed to stardom, if you will, and that sing songs about him, and he became a great leader, and he was trying to serve the present king Saul, and Saul would be so jealous, so envious that he would throw his spear at him and try to nail him to the wall. And soon he had to flee for his own life, and he traveled in and out of those those mountains and caves of Engedi, trying to save his own life, not, not because he had done anything wrong, but because the choices of someone else. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 33, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 
40 years. Why? They'll bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Those children of those early followers of Moses, well, they suffered the consequences of someone else. We, we, we do foolish things. Others bring suffering into our life. And, and even the enemy himself can bring suffering to you. In, in Revelation chapter 2, it says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, and here he goes, the enemy, the devil, is about to throw some of you into prison. That the enemy can come against you, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days, be faithful until death. They're going to die. And I will give you the crown of life. So I, I can bring suffering into my life. Others can. The enemy can. The fallen world that's full of sickness and all kinds of difficulties. I'll, I'll just read real quickly a few verses that speak of this in the book of Romans. It says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. We have a creation that's fallen, and it's full of storms, it's full of earthquakes, it's full of difficulties. The creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. We, we have a fallen world. And because of it, difficulties come and suffering comes. We, we have also what I would call God disciplining his own children. The scripture speaks of that. Let me just read to you a scripture. Sometimes this brings heartache and difficulty into people's lives. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons or daughters? Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Listen, let me have your attention. If you are God's child, every once in a while, he has to spank your hiney. Because you and I need it, right? David said, it was good for me to be afflicted. I needed it. You see, Hebrews chapter 12 speaks of that. It, it talks about that fact. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. A good parent. A loving father disciplines their children. Are they grow up rebels? I, I can remember having three kids growing up under me, and you know there were times we had certain so we had a certain kind of process that had to do with when they would be introduced to Mister Spoon, and we would take them off by themselves. We'd explain the infraction, what they had done. Very clearly, you did this, right? No, it's this. You did this, right? Yeah, you did it. Okay, you hit your sister. You lied, disrespected your mom. You, you, you destroyed some property. You, you did this. Once we got the confession out of them, then there was, well, the consequence. You know the consequence. We've talked about this. It's a spanking with the wooden spoon. And we'd spank them. They would scream and cry like we'd drove stakes through their heart, but... We did it. And then the next process was we would hug. We would restore. Price is paid. It's over. It's done. You're free. Go. Hit your sister again. No. What, what, you know, go. Be free. We'll see you next time. And, and the reason we disciplined them is because we loved them. Not because we wanted to. Well, there's a time, a few times I wanted to. But we didn't want them to be rebels. We didn't want them to get hurt by doing something foolish, you know, stick a fork in the socket or run out in the road or injure somebody or be disrespectful. No, we, we wanted to be able to come over to your house with our kids and people say, well, we'd like to have John and Lynn, but gosh, those kids, what a nightmare to climb. The curtains are all over. They're jumping on our couches. They're sticking knives in our wall. And we, didn't, we didn't want our kids to be that way. So we introduced them to 
correction. Because as you know and I know, kids are born little sinners. And whom the Father loves, he chastens. We don't want him to be disobedient. We don't want him to die by, by making foolish decisions because we didn't correct him or, or teach him about boundaries or truth. And so God does the same thing. And there's other times we suffer because we follow Christ. And that's what's being talking about, talked about here by the Apostle Paul, who's in prison because of his citizenship in heaven. And because he was willing to stand fast for the gospel. And it tells us here in 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You, when you see the Lord, I, I was willing to suffer for your sake. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of the God rests upon you. And on their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, well, because you were willing to suffer, he, he's glorified. But don't suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a busybody or, or other personal matters or If anyone suffers as a Christian, well, don't let him be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and it begins with us first. That will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good to a faithful creator. He says, yeah, suffering may come into your life because you seek to be a citizen of heaven. You strive to have a lifestyle. As Paul says it here, conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ, standing fast with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, in America, we've been very privileged to live our faith out fairly freely without persecution. That's not true everywhere around the world. And we live in a culture now, believe it or not, that's becoming more and more opposed to the viewpoints of the Bible. So the word of encouragement to us is to stand fast. We live, whether you know it or not, in a post-Christian culture, you and I. It's not the same as it used to be. And so this word for us is, I think, very current, very needed to hear. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Because here's the thing. Sometimes it's your conduct that speaks much louder than your voice could ever speak to those around you, to those at work, to those at school, that those who live in the neighborhood you live in. They see your life more than they hear what you have to say sometimes. Talk is pretty cheap. But when they see you living, and they say, well, wow, you know, their marriage seems to be pretty cohesive. It seems to be pretty together. Their, their kids seem to not be all strung out on drugs and had three divorces already, and their their life seems to be fairly joyous. How does that happen? They don't seem to be all freaked out by the news all the time or worried to death or panic. What's with these people? Well, they're they're citizens of of the kingdom. They're they're standing fast with their lifestyle for, for the sake of the gospel. They're not in fear of the enemy's lies. You know, today, before we leave, we're going to share together in communion. And as I said earlier, a battle was fought on the cross, and blood was shed. The juice represents his blood. A body was given and broken so that you and I not could become American citizens, 
Although, believe me, I'm very grateful to be a citizen of America. I've had the privilege to, to travel out of the country many, many times and be in a different culture. And you know what's interesting? Not everybody likes you as an American. They think we're loud. They think we're a little cocky. I'll, I'll never forget, I got lost once by myself in Paris. Nightmare. I had given my wife my briefcase. I was over there in Germany teaching, and I was with three other people, and I couldn't get through the turnstile in time to get on the train. And I finally, I was carrying the two giant suitcases. My wife had my briefcase with my passport, my phone, and uh, my ID. I had a bunch of euros in my pocket. That's all. So I get through the little thing. I go up to the train to get on. They're all in it, and the door closes, and off it goes. I'm three flights down from the from the ground level, and, I, and, and everyone speaks French. <laughs> and they won't speak English to you. I go up to the gate, and I go, uh, do you know how to get to such and such airport? Uh, no. What? You, you run a train station. Sorry. Do you speak English? No. <laughs> so, so I'm lost in Paris for a long time. And I'm trying to get someone to help me. No one liked me as an American. I finally run into this group of Canadian women who are talking, and I'm over, I'm kind of getting closer and closer to them, and I'm thinking, they're thinking, this guy's a total perf. (laughs) I'm kind of listening, and finally, they're they're speaking English. I said, hey, uh, excuse me, I'm not a weirdo. Are you guys going to the airport? Yes, yeah, we're going. I said, are you going to the United States? No, we're going to Canada. I said, well, it'd be okay if I followed you from train to train? I guess. I won't sit with you or anything. So I I made it there. My wife was already there. I get there, and the guy I was traveling with, him and another guy, my wife, and his wife had gone on to England, and so I'm I'm, I'm there, and, you know, what, what amazed me was, I found out that not everyone loves Americans. I, I was in Germany one time and visiting one of our missionaries, and we were at a coffee shop. And See, Americans are loud and rowdy. Europeans are kind of quiet. They sip their tea and eat their little crumpets. Americans aren't that way. We were sitting outside the coffee house. He's an American. I'm American. We're laughing. I got my feet up on a stool, another chair I pulled up, and we're laughing. We're having coffee, and this little German lady... Very, very prim, very proper. She's walking by like this. She's got a little shawl on. It's kind of cold. She's walking by. I got my feet on a chair. We're laughing. She stops right in front of us. She looks over at me, and she goes. (laughs) And then she walks off. I took my feet off the chair, sat straight up, sipped my coffee, you know. I was not an American. I was an American citizen. But over there, they didn't care for me so much. You and I have been called to be heavenly citizens. We've been called to be godly citizens of a godly kingdom. And in the culture we live in, people need to see it and hear it. They, They need to know there's a reason why I don't get drunk. There's a reason why I don't freak out in the culture we're in right now. There's a reason why I stay committed to my wife. There's a reason why I discipline my kids and try to bring them up in the godly home. There's a reason why I don't do certain things that the God of the belly or the lust of my flesh will really want to do because I serve a different king. I'm part of a different kingdom. My heart's been changed, and and by believing the gospel and allowing the scripture to rearrange my thinking and my priorities, I'm striving to stand firm together with other believers for the sake and the purpose of the one true God and the gospel that he's given to us. It's real. So why not live it? Why not believe it? Why not trust it? And why not together today celebrate it, right? So let's stand together. We're going to celebrate the fact that there was a Savior who fought a bloody battle, who gave his life for us, 
so that we might be able to choose to be citizens of a completely different kingdom. And, and I thought that we'd do it this way. Before we open the chalice here, maybe we'd sing, oh, you're just by yourself. We'll do it a different way. <laughs> we'll do it like this. Open it from the bottom. Take out the bread. Open the top where the juice is. And once again, the battle is fought. A sacrifice was given. For God so loved you and I that he gave his only begotten son who was broken for us. And if we would receive what he offers us, this eternal life, this truth of the gospel, not some watered down thing that we make up, but the truth of the gospel, then because of that blood and because of that body, we can become true citizens of heaven with all its rights and with all its privileges. And one of those privileges might be to suffer for his sake someday regardless of what that is, how minor or how large. And God says, you'll be rewarded for that. So today we celebrate our citizenship in heaven because of that battle, because of that victory. So let's eat and let's drink together. And one more thing that we can do together. Let's stand fast together. With one heart and one mind. Together for the sake of the gospel. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.